This is the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast. Critical care and emergency medicine education for nurses and paramedics. Here's your host, Eric Bauer. Hey everybody, this is Eric back with you. I just want to welcome everybody back to the show. Um, today we're going to jump into one of the topics that we discussed last week in the uh, three concepts kind of trending in, in, in critical care emergency medicine. And the big one that I've been looking at for a long time, I should say, the last um, probably 12 months is how can we change the paradigm? How can we change the culture? Um, you know, there's a lot of things happening in the critical care environment that we can look at from around the world. And how can we change that and tr- have that trickle down to the EMS realm, whether it's in HEMS or in the pre-hospital setting on an ambulance? Things that, that are changing shouldn't take five years. You know, an example of this that just blows my mind in Southern Oregon, where I where I grew up and uh, started my EMS career, you know, in Portland and, and in the, the Rogue Valley, you know, in the late 90s, 1999, 2000, we started, um, a physician there started one of the first STEMI programs in the whole United States. Now, that was in 1999, 2000. And it, when I moved to Tennessee in 2007... Um, there's, there were areas in the county that I started working for, they had just decided to enact a 12-lead uh, system, a 12-lead protocol, and a STEMI uh, protocol guidelines, which just blew my mind that it, that it takes that long to trickle. So I think that that's, that's, that's terrible. And I, I don't say that's, that it's terrible related to that service. I just think it takes a long time to have things trickle down to where we can see positive change. It's really important to have an avenue where we can share information, that we can collaborate and get this much needed um, research that's, that's being done constantly and have that trickle down not only to our ICUs, to our EDs, but it needs to trickle down to the front lines, to you out there that are, that's listening now. So this lecture will probably be a three-part lecture where we're going to discuss um, just a little bit of pathophysiology. We're going to jump into looking at an inopressor. Inopressors are considered like uh, dopamine and levofed. And then we're going to do a podcast on strictly uh, uh, potent vasopressors. And then we'll jump in and we'll do a podcast on inopressors. And then we'll do a podcast on inodilators like dobutamine and milurone. So when we look at dopamine versus levofed, I want to lay out an argument. I want to kind of debunk some of this culture where we're still stuck in the 1990s and dopamine is still on all these ambulances. Now, after collaborating and discussing this on Twitter and via email with different people around the United States, um, a few physicians in the, the Australia, Scotland area, I've identified that there are systems out there, there are EMS systems out there that have gotten rid of dopamine and they've jumped on the bandwagon of levofed. And that's excellent. But we need to make that systemic. We need to make that all over. So maybe your medical directors just aren't up on this new stuff, right? So maybe you're working for a service. These are things that you can take to them and show them. I'll publish and put these different articles, these different research um, uh, papers in the show notes, and you can print those off. You can go to these sites. You can read them for yourself, make a determination, and try it. If you've never tried Levafed, start trying it if you have that ability. All right, so let's jump in. We're going to just discuss um, distributive shock, but we have to remember that there's other forms of shock, right? We have obstructive shock. Obstructive shock is going to be like a tension pneumothorax, a pulmonary embolus. We have hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock is going to be uh, a volume issue, whether it's just normal volume or is it hemorrhagic in, in nature. We have a cardiogenic shock. That means we have a pump failure, right? Our, our engine is not pumping effectively, whether it's based on a dilated or restrictive cardiomyopathy. Is it a diseased mitral valve that's causing a backflow or a back pressure and impeding uh, flow that way and impeding cardiac output? Or is it distributive? Distributive means that you have a huge container failure. You have a vasodilation issue, 
you're leaking fluid somewhere or you have a, a vasogenic type situation where you have to make sure that you fill the container appropriately and cause enough squeeze to optimize flow. So what are our goals? Our goals for any type of shock state is to maintain a MAP blood pressure of 65. Again, if you haven't heard these, the, the podcast, if you haven't heard um, me rant about this, is blood pressures will lead you down the wrong road. We got to get rid of the mindset of looking at a blood pressure. We got to, you know, completely look at blood pressures from a different perspective and always calculate a MAP pressure. If your monitor doesn't do that for you, understand that you can do that in your head, right? The calculation to do a MAP blood pressure is diastolic. Multiplied by 2, take that number, add it to a systolic blood pressure, and divide that whole number by 3, and that's going to give you your MAP blood pressure. We have to have a MAP blood pressure of at least 65 for two big reasons. The first thing is 25% approximately of our cardiac output goes to our brain, and another 20-25% go to our kidneys. So those are two huge aspects of our cardiac output. They both need a MAP blood pressure of at least 60, 65. 65 is that golden number that we would love to see. But when we look at your brain specifically, your brain needs that perfusion. And the studies have shown if your brain doesn't receive a good MAP blood pressure, that doesn't translate to a good cerebral perfusion pressure, which we would like to see approximately 70, and you see it maybe a drop in MAP down below 50 millimeters of mercury, you start seeing pretty big ischemic changes. So you're going to start having um, a lack of oxygen, obviously, delivered to the brain. You're going to start having issues with um, patients becoming unresponsive, um, lethargic, and then we got an airway issue. Then we got to really deal with the airway. So anytime we can optimize MAP blood pressure, we need to be thinking about that ischemic effect that it's having on the brain, especially when we drop below 50 on our MAP blood pressure. And then your kidneys also need a huge amount of MAP blood pressure. Really, they need between 65 and 75, but your kidneys are really good at regulating the perfusion to them. And what I mean by that is if it senses that your MAP blood pressure isn't in that 65 range, it's going to slowly start clamping off and reducing flow, reducing uh, perfusion to the kidneys. That obviously reduces urine output. It stops producing pee, and it tries to shunt perfusion to other areas that need it. That's going to come into effect here later on when we discuss dopamine and when we discuss too much fluid volume. Okay, let's jump into a few aspects of pathophysiology. The first thing we have to remember is approximately 80% of our total blood volume is made up of systemic um, volume in our venous system. That's called unstressed volume. Unstressed volume is essentially that circulating um, storage. It's a, essentially a conduit reservoir system encompassing our whole body, makes up of 80% of our blood volume, with three-fourths of that actually stored in our small little veins and venules, capillaries, and things like that. So we have a huge amount of blood volume that's stored in that way. That's important because that volume that's stored is then uh, turned into a stressed volume, a stressed circulating volume in times of need. The other thing I want you to understand is a concept called delta P or delta pressure. Delta pressure is used a lot in multiple industries. Essentially, just a common definition is the pressure difference between um, what the, a fluid is being pushed through a filter, okay? So, or, or some type of, a, of a, a reservoir or pipe. We can utilize that concept in our patients by looking at the vessel, right? What's the pressure difference outside the vessel versus inside the vessel? And how does that pressure difference regulate flow? Essentially, we have to understand that flow is the, what we're trying to accomplish. We're not trying to accomplish so much squeeze that causes a good blood pressure. If you think about a medication like neosinephrine, for example, neosinephrine is a potent alpha-1 agonist. It's going to give you phenomenal squeeze. And just by looking at the monitor, you're going to have a great blood pressure. But does that squeeze actually optimize flow? 
And that's that is, it's no. It's got so much squeeze that neosinephrine actually will completely constrict off and reduce perfusion of the kidneys as well. So that's why it's always important to look at that medication and look at the patient's renal functions um, and think about clinical course. What's that medication going to do to your patient's uh, perfusion of the kidneys? And what is that going to cause down uh, long term? Another thing we have to understand is preload, right? Preload, afterload. And we have to remember that blood flows into our right atrium. That right atrium is a, a kind of a separate separate chamber that, that really does um, help with preload, right? 20% of the preload is actually from atrial kick. But 80% actually is just gravity fed, tr flows right through that tricuspid valve, fills that right ventricle up. That right ventricle, though, we have to remember, doesn't like excessive pressures. So the right ventricular systolic pressure is, should be equal to our pulmonary artery pressure. Our pulmonary artery is strictly there for, number one, utilizing a pathway for deoxygenated blood to get to the lungs to be oxygenated, but primarily for maintaining a good diastolic pressure. That diastolic pressure is important. We have to have a good diastolic pressure that's going to optimize our ventricular filling and clearing. So what we really see an adverse effect, if you have a, a huge change, and I, and I shouldn't say huge change, if you have a change of at least 10 millimeters of mercury in some patients in that pulmonary artery, that's going to translate to a change in our right ventricle. Our right ventricle, like I said, does not like huge pressure changes, and it's going to, it's going to become very ischemic very quickly. It, it just can't handle that. It actually will deviate the septum between the right ventricle and the, the left ventricle and deviate that septum into the uh, left ventricular chamber. That's going to impede or reduce our ejection fraction. So we have to be thinking about we don't want too much volume going in. We don't want too much pressure exerted against that right ventricle. We want good preload, but we don't want so much um, pulmonary vascular resistance that causes an adverse effect. Well, how do we get too much pulmonary vascular resistance? Well, remember, just a hypoxic event in of itself, your, your, your lungs are going to start constricting down. And remember, we don't fly patients that are, that are perfectly um, healthy. I mean, we fly most of our patients have some type of underlying chronic disease process, whether it's COPD, whether it's uh, uh, CHF, something like that. They already have a a level of pulmonary vasoconstriction. Well, our lungs attempt to hoard or keep as much oxygen stored in them in states where they sense hypoxia. Well, that's just going to increase pulmonary vascular resistance. Pulmonary vascular resistance, resistance actually translates to higher right ventricular pressures. Right ventricular pressures that are high translates to a higher pulmonary artery pressure, and that's just going to affect things going on downstream. If you have this high pulmonary vascular resistance and you have very um, negative effects on that right ventricle, what's going to happen to preload? Well, preload is going to go down the toilet. Okay, so we have to be thinking about this in a completely circular motion. We have to deal with the oxygenation, right? We have to deliver enough oxygen to be uh, good enough to meet the demand of our patient. But remember, how do we circulate that oxygenation? Well, we have to have good flow. So you can see that everything is kind of intertwined. We have to deliver the oxygen. The oxygen is bound to hemoglobin. Remember, 98% is bound to hemoglobin. 2% is actually dissolved in the plasma. We utilize those plasma stores. So we have to optimize that. By, optimize, by optimizing oxygenation, you're going to lower the incidence of pulmonary vasoconstriction, which is going to optimize preload. But you have to circulate that hemoglobin. Obviously, we utilize the 2% of, of our plasma stores ongoing, and we have a huge amount of uh, stores on our hemoglobin. And in a normal homeostasis, we deliver about 1,000 mils a minute of oxygen. That's a huge amount of reserves. But in a hyperdynamic state like sepsis, um, like a cardiogenic shock situation, we, do n we don't ever meet that demand. It's very, very hard to meet the demand. So we all, we're always having to 
play catch up. And we utilize labs such as our base excess, such as our SVO2 and our lactate to kind of determine where we are on that linear line of meeting the demand. Are we delivering enough oxygen? Again, we have to be able to deliver it in an optimizing way. So that's where we start having to look at flow. What medication are we going to deliver? And we're looking at dopamine versus levofed right here. So dopamine, is it going to give you good squeeze, very low O2 consumption, low heart rate effects, or is it going to ju do just the opposite? And is levofed going to optimize preload? Is it going to limit heart rate effects? Or is it going to increase heart rate effects? So we're going to kind of lay out the argument between the two. Ultimately, what we need to have is we need to have a good left ventricular end diastolic pressure. That's going to optimize ventricular filling and clearing. That's going to obviously translate to good afterload. So when we look at this, how can we change this paradigm? How can we look at, at this and understand the benefits of both. Obviously, we want to turn that unstressed volume that utilizes itself as stressed volume in a, in a hyperdynamic state. We want to be able to optimize that flow, which optimizes hemoglobin uh, circulation, which optimizes oxygenation, which reduces pulmonary vascular resistance because it reduces pulmonary vasoconstriction. You can understand that that ultimately optimizes preload, which optimizes afterload. Everything is intertwined. So how do we kind of relate to these patients? Well, the other thing to think of is fluid. And for years, we have given so much fluid, right? We've just dumped normal saline. I mean, I remember trauma patients where I've given four or five liters of fluid. You know, and back when I started, we, you know, we tried to get a blood pressure of 120 over 80, you know, or something over 100 systolic. And I've delivered patients to trauma centers where, you know, they're still bleeding out, but it's like Kool-Aid. Well, what did I do? I mean, I killed, I killed the patient that way. You know, we all probably have done that. And I don't know why, you know, you just don't think of the, the concepts. You know, we're, re, we're replacing volume, but we're not replacing volume with something that's going to optimize oxygenation that, that actually has oxygen carrying capacity. So, um, we need to always think of the amount of volume we're given. The other aspect is, remember, normal saline is a very acidotic fluid. And there's countless studies that have shown that in especially trauma, uh, but in really any situation, you're going to have a uh, detrimental effect of too much volume. The first issue you have is an inflammatory response. Because of the acidosis, aspect of normal saline because of the high amounts of sodium the high amounts of chloride the hyper uh, chloremic acidosis phenomenon but also the acidosis aspect of the fluid right the ph is, is approximately 6.0 you have a high incidence of potential inflammatory response remember that fl inflammatory response is a big uh, thing right you have these inflammatory mediators that are released you have uh, these cytokines that leak into the cytosol of the cell that leak out. They start destroying epithelial tissues. They start, start destroying fats, lipids, carbohydrates, things like that. And it also starts um, destroying something called the glycocalyx. Well, the glycocalyx is something that is on the surface of all of our vessels. And think of it as hair-like projections that come off of the vessel. And essentially what it does is it holds that osmotic pressure. It holds that fluid in those vessels. So when we see sepsis, right, we have a huge capillary leakage phenomenon. And that's the whole, whole issue is we've had an inflammatory response that's destroyed that glycocalyx. So instead of having all these hair-like projections holding that fluid in, imagine somebody coming... Use your, your lawn, your front yard as an example. The dirt is the vessel. The grass is the glycocalyx. And imagine you starting to pull huge chunks of grass out and you have dirt exposed. Well, that's essentially what happens is this inflammatory response starts eating up and destroying that glycocalyx. So now you have capillary leakage. And so this 
unstressed volume that we need to turn into stress volume in these times of um, illness, now you have this stress volume that starts leaking out. You start third spacing all this fluid. Well, other causes of this is, is not only the inflammatory response, but you also have, um, if you give too much volume, you have this volume that comes into the right atrium. That right atrium is going to expand. Remember I said atrial kick. But if we, if we stretch the right atrium, if we stretch the right ventricle too much, you have release of atrial natriuretic peptide. That molecule or that enzyme actually does a few things. Number one, it reduces urine output. It, it tells the kidneys to shut off urine output. The other thing it does is it starts breaking down that glycocalyx even more. So a little bit of fluid is good, too much fluid is bad. That glycocalyx is a big, big deal. That's why utilizing a, a, a protein um, volume expander like albumin in sepsis early has shown positive uh, effects because of the, the, the osmotic pressure issue of the glycocalyx and the breakdown of that glycocalyx. So how much fluid is, is appropriate? Well, we don't need to be using six to 10 liters in 24 hours like we used to. We need to be using probably two to three liters max on these patients and start a presser very, very early. Again, the first one we're gonna talk about is dopamine. Dopamine is the one that we have on all these ambulances around the country. And here are the negative effects. Number one, um, utilize the dopamine, the dose range, the therapeutic range, really where we're going to see positive effects, if any, is between that 5 and 10 mics per kilogram a minute. That's pretty much it. Once you go above 10 mics, you're going to start having decreased cardiac output aspects. It really doesn't benefit us to use it below 5 mics, so you really have a really um, narrow therapeutic window right there. One of the things you have with dopamine is you have a dopaminergic stimulation response. And what that does is it increases urine output. So remember, we utilize urine output for um, an identification of perfusion, right? That's the poor man's swan, is if your patient is peeing, they're perfusing. Well, what dopamine does is it, it actually optimizes urine output. And if your kidneys have already decided to shunt off in that shock state, if we don't have a MAP blood pressure that's actually giving the kidneys um, the right amount of perfusion to produce urine output, but we now give dopamine that has this huge dopaminergic stimulation response, and we now start urine output, it's going to give us the false sense that we're actually perfusing when we're not. It's going to lead you down the wrong road. There's a very high incidence of AFib with dopamine. Very high incidence. So you also have a very poor cardiac output effect. It's got a lot of inotropy, right? It's got a lot of heart rate effects. So you're going to have this huge amount of heart rate um, where it's not going to allow for good diastolic clearing and filling. I can't tell you how many times I've went on a flight where I've arrived at a small ICU or ER and I've had a patient that's in profound hemodynamic collapse and they're on dopamine at 20 mics a minute. Their blood pressure is 60 systolic. They're uh, MAP pressure is in the toilet, and their heart rate is 140s, 150s. And all you do is you switch to, to Levofed, and you turn that dopamine off, and that they're a completely different patient. It completely changes their whole hemodynamic outlook. The problem, again, is people don't understand that the therapeutic window is very, very narrow. You have that really poor cardiac output aspect above 10 mics. Um, and there's just better options out there. If you have a heart rate that's going 140, 150, how are you allowing the heart ample time to fill that left ventricle and clear that left ventricle? If you don't have good filling and clearing, you have no afterload. If you don't have any afterload, you have no preload. And it's a big kind of spiral of death, really. And it's all because of that dopamine. So now let's look at norepinephrine, levofit. The culture has always been, especially 15 years ago, levofit, leave them dead. There was all these misnomers, misconceptions on it, but there has been countless papers, research studies on norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is a very potent alpha-1, alpha-2 vasoconstrictor. It's got good venous and arterial vasopressor effects. 
So that's great. We have good venous and arterial. We're going to optimize that stressed volume that's stored in our venous system, and we're going to optimize the arterial side as well. By giving your low amounts of volume, right? Give two liters of fluid and starting levofed early, which is going to optimize that preload. If it optimizes preload, it optimizes afterload. You're going to get good heart rate effects. You're going to get good cardiac output effects. You're going to get good stroke volume. And overall, you're going to get good diastolic filling and clearing, which optimizes flow. Everything is related to flow. Remember, we have to have good flow to circulate our hemoglobin. If we can't circulate our hemoglobin, we have no oxygen um, that's going to be transported to the cells that need it to optimize ATP production. We have to have good ATP production. There's no studies out there that show any adverse effects with norepinephrine. So again, you know, this is something where you're going to have to look at this, read these studies, make a determination of your uh, based on what you read. But there's no um, study out there that shows that there's any adverse effects to, to norepinephrine in a, in a shock state versus dopamine. But I can tell you that there's multiple negative effects of dopamine. So for me, the only time I'm ever going to pull dopamine out is, is maybe in a patient that has a bradycardic underlying bradycardic rhythm that's translated to a hypotensive hemodynamic um, crash. And dopamine may be a good bridge to increase that rate because of the inotropic effects, and that's going to optimize that cardiac output in that way. But it really, that's the only time I'm going to pull it out. So here's some, a few key things with norepinephrine. Early administration has shown that norepinephrine um, increases survival rate in septic shock. Early norepinephrine in, in, initiation can increase that MAP pressure. Remember, we've got to have good MAP to perfuse our brain or our kidneys. It shortens the duration of the hypotension because it optimizes the preload. And it improves circulation and perfusion to those vital organs. And lastly, it decreases serum lactate levels. That's a huge thing, guys. Serum lactate is an indication of morbidity and mortality. It's not an indication of tissue hypoxia, but it's a huge indication of how the patient's going to do. So lactate clearance is a big, big thing. Prompt aggressive norepinephrine treatment is something we should always consider an initial resuscitation in a distributive shock patient. So remember, this is a great medication. We see countless patients in sepsis. We see countless patients with underlying UTIs that have progressed to sepsis and septic shock. Remember, if they don't respond to the, that initial fluid challenge of one to two liters, which you can put in really, really rapidly, and you need to start that norepinephrine really early. Be aggressive with this. Utilize it early. Optimize that preload. The earlier you optimize preload, that's going to translate to optimal afterload. It's going to translate to better stroke volume and cardiac output, which optimizes flow. And everything is related to flow because if we can't provide good flow, we can't circulate the oxygen. We can't circulate the hemoglobin. That's a huge thing. So that's all I have for this podcast. If you have any questions, please email me. I'd love to discuss this with, with you. If you have any protocols out there that you have um, seen or your program has started looking at uh, norepinephrine and they, they want different studies, just contact me. I'll forward um, as many studies as I have or I have found. Again, I will put these different studies in the show notes. I'm going to do a blog post on this and kind of lay this out in a, in a more articulate way to where you can read this as well. And, uh, you know, I really believe that hearing something, seeing something um, really adds to the learning process. So that'll be another avenue for you to kind of digest all this information. Again, we're going to do a couple more podcasts on this. Uh, the next podcast will kind of be more of a um, just a quick uh, little podcast. I probably won't do it on this. So be looking for this in two more weeks. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll dive into the pure vasopressors. We'll kind of look at phenylephrine. Uh, which is neosinephrine and vasopressin and its role in critical care medicine. And then in uh, two weeks after that, we'll kind of look at the inodilator medications like dobutamine and um, milurone. Again, if you have any questions, please email me. Uh, I want to thank you for all the emails I get, for all the kind words. Um, our listenership has just skyrocketed, and uh, 
and that's a testament to you guys. And I, I can't stress how grateful I am for each and every one of you for uh, taking the time to listen to me and uh, uh, for supporting Flybridge Ed. Uh, it's been uh, an amazing road so far, very rewarding. And again, I owe it all to you guys. So please uh, kind of take all this and digest it and. I'd love to hear from you. I'll talk to you soon. This has been a production of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, leading the way in pre-hospital critical care and emergency medicine education. 